Welcome, welcome. My name is Tom Hoon. I chair the BFA program in Visual and Critical Studies here at SVA. Um, I usually introduce our guest speakers, but this evening I'm going to defer to the Director of Operations, Paloma Cruciat. Um, Paloma's in an especially apt position to uh, introduce this evening's speaker. So, Paloma. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's uh, special guest, Rosemary Balsam. Rosemary is a member of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh, fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, London, associate clinical professor of psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine, and staff psychiatrist in the Yale Department of Student Health, a training and supervising analyst at the Western New England Institute for Psychoanalysis. She has lived, taught, and practiced in New Haven, Connecticut since the 1970s. Her special interests are female development, young adulthood, and the work of Hans Lowald. She has written award-winning papers, lectured both in the US and abroad, and she was the National Woman Traveling Psychoanalytic Scholar for APSA in 2005. Her recent book, Women Bodies in Psychoanalysis, which is upstairs in the uh, BCS library, um, retraces theoretical steps of psychoanalysis back to the biological body's attributes, searching for clues in our mental development. And I very look forward to hearing more about this. So without further ado, please wel um, join me in welcoming Rosemary. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear? Um, if, if you can't hear, Please let me know. Um, very nice, Paloma, and congratulations. What can I say? It's a wonderful moment in life. And um, we're here. We're friends of Tom Hoon. And we're really, my husband and I are delighted to um, be with you and take part in your company for a little while this evening. So uh, I call my talk the pregnant body through the looking glass of psychoanalysis. And that had partly to do with coming to the School of Visual Arts. I thought how visual this topic really is. And it helped to bring to the forefront <laughs> uh, a real need on my part. I have put it off for years um, trying to make a PowerPoint presentation. So I have a few slides this evening um, in your honor uh, because I think um, you helped me really push myself to make a few slides that I can show. I'm used to just talking in text form. So. so sometimes I think that modern, sensible people who are not in the psychoanalytic profession or those who are just doing fine in life without knowing anything about psychoanalysis in particular, they'd find it hard to credit that there could be any debate at all about the role of the body especially the female body in mental life, let alone credit the hot and cold wars that it has generated over 125 years of psychoanalysis, plus its uncertain Western beginnings with the ancient Greeks. Strange ideas have been put forward about female functioning. The form of the material body would seem to be obvious to anyone who's able to see it. It seems pretty simple, too, to allow that the development of a person's body, including its sex characteristics from childhood onward, influences his or her behavioral attitudes and mind. Experience accrues expressions of certain perceptions of the surrounding world are internalized, including one's family atmosphere. However, the incredible story of female body distortion that I personally encountered, encountered late through my study of the theory of psychoanalysis and the theory of mind, not interestingly in my own prior study of medicine. And this was when I was already 30 in the early 70s, and it turns out actually to have a very long history in the human race. And to my mind these days in clinical and theoretical psychoanalysis, such history is still in the making. And I'm, mostly, I'm going to talk mostly about the female body. Male bodies need attention too, and that's a whole 
other area of work that people have begun to think more about, um, but they're not subject to quite as strange perceptions as female bodies. So originally I was amazed to read about Freud's uh, view from the 1920s that a little girl child thought she was a boy from the beginning. In fact, she was a boy subjectively in her mind until she became shocked at the sight of a real boy's penis and decided she must therefore have been castrated by her mother usually and left with her tiny, miserably inferior clitoris, which allegedly was no compensation for masturbation purposes. Freud's, this was Freud's notori notorious theory of uh, ubiquitous female penis envy then. You can see logically builds on this story. It culminates with the notion that in maturity, a baby born to a woman is thus received joyfully as her recovered long lost penis. It is intriguing and a well-structured narrative that was first composed by the men of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society in response to their understanding of the inner lives of the women they saw in treatment in Vienna at the turn of the 20th century, many of whom in fact were very, very dissatisfied by their opportunities in life compared to men. But there still are people who are, there still are women who are, definitely. And, but they felt they were resigned to that state society having attributed to it only the biological fact that they were women. This myth of women as poor boys, distinct from the accurate idea that a female from her beginnings took in that she is female, given her various internal sensory and external family inputs, this was explained by analysts as the purported universal sexed gender portrait in every woman's unconscious mind. This denied Karen Horney, whom I'm sure you have heard of. There's a Karen Horney Institute here. Uh, she was trained in Berlin, and um, she was a contemporary to these people who also were claiming that, and she claimed a primary femininity that worked just the same way that Freud asserted that a boy knew from the beginning that he was a boy. But females, her truth, as it were, the female's truth was held as false from the start. Hence, this defined the female in a state of lacking. You may be familiar with that from critical studies and literary studies talking about females as lacking and less than male. There are throwaway sentiments still around that girls are not as smart as boys or as creative or as full of new ideas no good at maths. Apparently the old the Barbie doll has said uh, math class is very hard and that's being attacked at the moment. And um, however inaccurate, this kind of gender biased thought is centuries old, that's what I'm interested in, was backed up by pseudoscience and therefore to me is very, very interesting. The opposite sentiments are that girls are more empathic, more caretaking, and better at making pies than boys. All of these qualities, though, were considered not to be the result of what we now call social constructivism, but as a result of biological essentialism thinking. That is, if a female gives birth to babies, she therefore, it doesn't mean that Paloma is, may not be this way, but just because you give birth to a baby, therefore, by nature, you, sh you must be caretaking and loving towards others. Now, note well that nobody counts in mean girls here, and the gang in my hometown called the Belfast Bitches, or takes into account women's desire to murder babies. If these things happen, um, that thinking goes that a girl is totally off track as female, and perhaps she's male at heart, or has brain disease, or at the turn of the century she was considered degenerate. So you can see how hard it is to acknowledge that there is no correlation between the ability to give birth to a baby and having an automatic loving desire towards others. 
One can say authentically these days, that is, and that as far as wishes and desires go, that women like men are on a spectrum and that all humans are capable of mixed desires towards their offspring and towards others. It is an acceptable argument to correlate a biolog biological upsurge of, say, the hormone oxytocin that helps with bonding a baby after giving birth. And this hormone can also be, uh, there can be upsurges of this hormone also in a man who picks up a baby and is responsive and it helps, it helps on tenderness and bonding. But it's particularly marked in women after giving birth. However, uh, hostility towards the baby and so on can override these hormones and so psychologically that can be more important. Anyway, simultaneously Freud did offer a very useful idea post-1923 um, with the tripartite theory which is ego, superego and id that you're probably familiar with and he said that the ego is first and foremost a bodily ego. Freud's followers, including some very smart, clinically sophisticated female doctors like Helena Deutsch and the elegant worldly Princess Marie Bonaparte and his famous analyst daughter, Anna Freud, they all followed the master and sincerely believed in a girl's, for example, phallic narcissistic stage at around four to six, like where a girl think she's a boy. They weren't talking about a girl just having fantasies of being a boy. They were talking about her as if she really thought she was a boy as a necessary part of female development with the emphasis on phallic desire. So the earliest feminist challenge gathered momentum in the 1970s in America in the second wave of feminism. And these days, you're fully aware that this phallocentricity was attacked vigorously. Now take the questioning of what is a woman in, say, Simone de Beauvoir's foundational 1949 study, The Second Sex, and remember Freud's famously annoyed question in the same vein, what does woman want? That was in 1925 to Marie Bonaparte. He said, the great question that has never been answered and which I have not yet been able to answer despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul is, what does a woman want? Now de Beauvoir said, how is it then that reciprocity has not been recognized between the sexes? Why is it that women do not dis dispute male sovereignty? No subject will readily volunteer to become the object, the inessential. And eventually she says, whence comes this submission in the case of a woman? Now I'll jump the gun to my own take on this issue, which is dealt with at length and with much clinical emphasis in the book. They talked about women's bodies, the psychoanalysis, I guess, it's the title. Of. I believe with Freud that the answer actually is in the mysteries of the body as represented in the mind and that Freud and others have claimed that male reaction to the female genital is the main source of fear and repudiation. And later feminist writers pointed out how women identify also with this dominant defining male point of view and join in their own repudiation. And I favor a little different argument that the genitals and the horrors of menstruation, et cetera, are just way stations to the more important scene of psychic action. And I think it's the capacity to become pregnant and bear a baby that has taken the imagination of the human race and filled us, both men and women, consciously at times, but certainly unconsciously, with awe and dread, and as well as a fear of an excess of pleasure in this phenomenal and mystical power to ignite and create life that is beyond our rational understanding. I think that there's evidence that women too are afraid and repelled as well as held awestruck in its fix. <clears throat> and that women's negative reactions to their own bodies, the source of this very power, are their own reactions importantly negotiated between mother and daughter, especially, and among women. 
are not necessarily all the result of identifying with either male repulsion or admiration. And you remember Julia Kristeva has something to say about that topic, about the horror of the abject she talks about, and the, the talking about the uh, female body as a source of, um, the, it, it can um, stimulate uh, such horror that she makes um, analogies to the cadaver and things that are rotting and in decay. Um, so this study of this has wide implications. I'm not saying there's not great beauty and all kinds of wonderful things about the female body as well, but I'm talking about the source of the uh, repudiation of females. For example, the history of philosophy is entrenched with a dualism which places male and female virtues in different positions and the ideals of reason have always been construed as basically masculine and also superior. The feminine has undergone shift. A Cartesian man of learning, for example, was supposed to be rational and transcend and separate off his soft emotions. Kant, Hegel, and Freud all saw the feminine as falling short of the masculine. So I was busy talking about how women were and are seen not in complementary ways as very close to nature, basically because carrying children, of carrying children in their bodies, we are women and men too, of course, like other mammalian animals. So there is a general distaste for what is thought of as irrational, emotive, and seen as a kind of too muchness or larger than life fantasies in mental content that are often associated with female. Hysteria, for example, is always mainly associated with females. A pregnancy might therefore readily be viewed as associated with female, inferior, irrational, being the most earthy of states, the symbol of a woman as all body to a man that is all mind, the female as housing the fruit of guilt-laden sexual intercourse, resulting in an unseen witch-like power of the meshing of ungovernable genetic codes inside the woman. Even modern clinical psychoanalytic observations can fall under the sway and unwittingly be affected. The irrational arenas of mental existence being so disturbing that the whole package of the capacity of a female body to become procreative can be consigned to a, defense, a defensive erasure in our theory. It's not hardly dealt with at all. And right now, in contemporary times, one way that I think our field has dealt with the essential embarrassment of uh, Freud talking so much about uh, phallic narcissism and penis envy and so on, and women feeling really not seen a lot and quite angry about these interpretations. And the field is so embarrassed that I think that they have retreated entirely from it. And there's hardly any word at all these days about the body. It's all about uh, trauma and unrepresented states and very, very early archaic fantasy life that people are quite interested in. The fact that pregnancy and childbirth have been so invisible in, now the bonding, we were talking earlier about, there's a lot of uh, material in our field about once the baby is born, uh, the relationship between the mother and the early baby, and so much attention is paid to the baby, in fact, and the attitudes towards the baby and so on, that it really kind of is another way of disappearing the mother sometimes, that the mother in her own entity and in her own body is not really paid attention to. So it is really kind of curious that, the, you know, in spite of the blatant present, the visual command of any pregnant woman who walks into a room, and the fact that almost every woman patient past 40 in treatment is likely to have had the experience of childbirth. Um, that's scarcely talked about. They, uh, people will, therapists talk to, the pa to their patients about the relationship with their children. Uh, there's so much emphasis on the children and the relationships 
and so on, that they, it rarely is mentioned anything about, you know, what did it feel like in your body? Well, you know, what did you go through when you were giving birth to this child? So, um, Later, I hope, to, I hope I'll have time to include some clinical vignettes and stories about that. Um, now on to the sexed body. Um, I, I wanted, in order to try to investigate this more thoroughly, I um, focused very much on the anatomical aspects of the female. And that's my starting and entry focus to this whole topic of sex and gender, which is a huge topic, really. And the reason is that the, these elements to me are unambiguously, incontrovertibly, and distinctly separately sexed, females and males. Everything else about sex and gender is much more labile and ambiguous. I'm not talking about the gender of an individual cannot be ascertained reliably at all by any outside or object, any kind of objective observation. People who say, oh, you know, she holds herself in a very feminine way, therefore she's feminine. That's, you know, you have to know that's an outside observation. The only person who can tell the details of what it is is the person herself. And uh, whatever she makes of it is, is really what counts. So one of the things that happened in our field, which went along with the feminist um, critique also, is that um, the California analyst Robert Stoller decoupled sex from gender. So that sex was seen as biological, while gender constituted the psychological portrait of a person and with all its mix of influence of male and female elements. And I find this very liberating for my thinking. I still um, work with that um, separation. So when the objective ob observations of distinguishable anatomy itself are distorted, it seems to me that a closer look at those making these observations is possible and we might learn something. So, um, the first slide that I'm going to show you, this slide is um, an Italian ceramic from the 19th century. These terracotta images were uh, sculpted um, and they were used by obstetricians and they were used for um, a medical instruction. And you'll see on this image, you know, this um, really beautiful Italian woman, and they always had uh, them very well dressed and beautiful hair, jewelry in some cases, um, bodies that can be kind of taken apart in puzzles, and always a kind of, um, uh, you know, I'd be terribly interested in, uh, you people are real experts in images, and what this kind of image does to one you know, it, and it seems to me to invite the viewer to really identify with the object of sometimes these very gory uh, dissections. But you're invited in this instance, obviously, to see the uterus. You can see the intestines, and um, it's um, on display. Okay, a tiny story about this. When I was doing my book, uh, they said to me, the publisher said, um, do you have a photograph that you, do you have anything that you would like to put on the cover of your book? And I said, oh yes, I have this wonderful image that I found in Florence, and I think this is the most terrific thing. It's, it's of a beautiful Italian woman, and I, I really think this is the image. And I sent them the image, and they said, oh no, they said, not that, that's terrible. They said, nobody would touch your book if you put that on the cover. So I thought that was quite interesting since that's the topic. <laughs> Nobody would touch that on the cover. Anyway, so on to the next slide. This, uh, these are, this is an anatomical drawing from Vesalius, was the first um, uh, anatomist doctor who uh, presided over and really public dissections. 
um, he would have an amphitheater like this and there would be, he would be like down there somewhere and the seats would be higher or there'd be like hundreds of people in the audience, all males, and the body would be lying in, you know, in these woodcuts in very salacious positions. And sometimes they would have like a, somebody like in a kind of pulpit that was up above the anatomy and the people in the pulpit apparently would read from texts that had very little to do with what exactly was happening on the dissection scene. Um, so that they were learning all the time unconsciously. I mean, we do this all the time. We imitate, we take as granted things that have been discovered before and we keep repeating them and that, you know, this is a very good uh, example of it. So Galen had, um, this was from the second century or so, they did no dissections hardly at all then, and um, these images uh, would have been really based on stuff that the Greeks had done, even though this was now 1538. So I'll point out a few things, yeah, um, okay. This is the female, and this is her penis. And the, every, all the um, terminology was male. Uh, they did call it the pudenda sometimes. Um, and a woman was supposed to be a man inside out. So if you take these testes and imagine that the bladder was, if you sort of blew up the penis, um, inverted the man that you would make the woman. And that was the theory about how women developed. So, um, and these were the, the so-called, the female testes are up here, you see, upside down. The male testes are down here, or they call them the cotyledons. So, now this is a female sculpture from, um, 1522, and again, you can see that these uh, were quite elaborate um, sculptures that, you know, showed, you know, very um, inviting kind of women. Um, this is supposed to show you that this is her penis, and her, this uh, uterus thing is uh, like supposedly like a male bladder and the horns of the uterus and the male, the female testes are up here. And um, okay, and the second one is the, the same model. Um, it gives you a full picture of her and she's supposed to be kind of pointing there on the right to her, uh, to, that's her uterus, um, which isn't uh, gravid. I mean, it doesn't have a baby under it, but you know, the uterus is really quite small if that's the case, but this giant thing that is like a blown up bladder and the a penis she's supposed to be showing you as a kind of animated cadaver um, the voice of the anatomist, she, and she's sort of inviting you to join with the anatomist and saying, look how the neck of my matrix, the, the matrix was another word they used um, for the uterus, and um, look how much it looks like a penis. Now, this is the, I think, the most shocking one of all, that this actually is supposed to be 1543, Vesalius, the vagina as penis. Uh, these are both pictures of the vagina, supposedly, and the uterus and vagina clearly look like a bladder and penis. Um, they sometimes would draw the uterus with a tiny child that would be put in this area, this area up here. There's a tiny little child in some of the drawings, um, but this long uh, sheath-like part was supposed to be the vagina. Um, another one, uh, this was a kind of user-friendly version of Vesalius's thing, 
Uh, it's drawn by Friar Mercurio, and it was to show midwives. It was instructional for midwives in 1596, so that was almost 1600. And you can see at the top, the A there is a cavity divided according to Galen into two parts. Some people thought that the uterus was divided into seven parts, uh, but Galen thought two. And then there's the, the B is the neck of the uterus, and C is the, what they call the natura, or the vagina, and the D would be the testes of the women. So that also was supposed to be instructional to pregnant women. Uh, this, interestingly, I think is very interesting about a picture of how a baby is born, and this too was from the same manual for midwives. There had been a lot of discussion about how girls were born facing the sky and boys were born facing the ground. So this was kind of cutting edge that said that the, this was a normal birth position. But you can see how massively, amazingly kind of distorted that is. Um, it's a really interesting thing that the history of female orgasm, it was believed from the fifth century to the 18th century, fifth to the 18th century, that conception couldn't take place without orgasm. Um, and every medical and every effort was made to have a woman achieve orgasm. So in that period that orgasm and erotics were very much on the forefront of consciousness, but it turned out that it actually wasn't so much that people thought that women were, so, it was so important for women to be sexual, it was just that fertility was the engine that uh, powered um, the other social forces and that it was important for the women to get pregnant. Um, so this is often the case, too, that on the surface, that female eroticism, when it's the prime locus of attention, you will very often find that it also is associated with the uh, issues about uh, being pregnant or not, not being pregnant, markedly not being pregnant for uh, people like models and so on, the skinnier the better, it's accented visually, this person is not pregnant and is therefore on the market to be pregnant. Uh, and this is, it. I'm not complaining, I mean, this is not a terrible thing, but it's just something to be aware of. So, um, and I have the uh, dissection of the human body was new and newly openly permitted at this time in the Renaissance. Now I'm going to show you two pictures from Leonardo, and you will see that there is a vast difference between Leonardo's conception, but this was 1497, which is actually, um, so Leonardo um, was, is an extremely interesting character, as I'm sure you know, uh, he actually, was totally disgusted by um, sexual intercourse. And people think that it shows in this. He, he just did a couple of drawings of intercourse. Um, but, you know, th these are very um, kind of much more uh, from the life, as it were. He did hundreds of um, dissections of humans. and. Um, but still, there are all kinds of errors in this, one being that there's several channels for, drawn from the penis to the spine, because the spine was supposed to be the source of how sperm were made. And they, there are pictures of intercourse that he has drawn where the penis actually penetrates the uterus. Um, another feature here, which is interesting, is that there's a blood vessel that goes in the female right up to the nipple here. And in those days, they thought that, uh, they called it the fungibility of fluids, that blood would turn into, um, blood would turn into milk. Um, 
when a woman was pregnant and she wasn't menstruating, that the blood would go backwards and go up this vessel. Now, these are very interesting because otherwise Leonardo was um, very accurate in so much of what he did with muscles and um, arteries and so on. But um, these things have inaccuracies. Now, the other thing that he did, which Leonardo did, which is uh, truly magnificent, is a whole series of pictures of a fetus in a womb. And this is, these are really very accurate. Um, some people think that because he didn't have to draw the female body here, he was just dissecting, literally dissecting out the uterus, he could actually focus on the baby. And of course, his focus was extremely scientific about a passion to know how things worked. I mean, above all, that was one of his passions. So it's interesting that these drawings that are so sophisticated are done at the same time as these medical illustrators who also were considered very significantly excellent artists. And, um, but they were very much in the presence of medical teaching and how medicine was being promulgated to the next generation. So I think that'll do my, okay. So now I'm going to move on to some clinical lingering. So I'm going to bring you up to the present. And we're going to move to the 1930s and beyond that in New York to the golden age of psychoanalysis, 1930s, 1960s. So I wanted to draw attention to a paper by an analyst called Bertram Lewin who was very highly regarded, and he was one of the founders of the Institute here. And he was educated, like Karen Horney, he had been educated in Berlin. So he must have been quite aware of her foundational papers in female development, which Freud had been quite opposed to, um, and uh, many of his followers. So this paper was called The Body as Phallus. Now, Lewin began by praising Freud, saying, in psychoanalysis, we're accustomed to a shorthand statement of this fact. We say there is an unconscious equation of body and phallus, or of child and phallus. Now, you know, you can see that there's an identical uh, path from Galen to uh, these pictures in the 16th, 16th century um, of medical science and Lewin, who says in the 1930s and beyond to the 1950s, there were many people who, who uh, contributed to this. They felt it to be a fact and an equation. They were totally certain the body as phallus. So a merger of the kind I had speculated as a kind of merger with medical illustrators that I imagined that there is so much anxiety in looking closely at the female organs and these organs of procreation, and there's so much anxiety involved in that, that one of the defensive features, human defenses, ordinary defenses that we have is to blend with the materials that we're working with and not keep ourselves separate. So that in these instances, they were all males who were doing these and they seemed to blend with the females and then read the females through the knowledge of their own bodies uh, rather than keep things separate, which would make things more anxious. So I think that this continues right into the analytic tradition um, he says that, uh, and this was part of a one-sex theory, Thomas Lacour has written a lot about this beautifully in 1990. Um, he um, says that there's a one-sex theory which uh, is opposed to a two-sex theory, and the one-sex theory is essentially the lecture I've given you just now. Organs of the body can become eroticized. They really can, as either male or female but here, the body organs were only imagined in erection. 
So the equation of body as phallus is expressed as a generalization of the whole body, uh, Lewin says, that takes place normally in women at puberty. So a female's puberty or a female body with her adolescent hormone boost with full sensualized sexuality, including her normal skin erotic sensitivities, would be interpreted as phallic. And there was no symbol or anything thought about as actively sexual embodied pubertal female. Obviously ignoring the poet's vision uh, even of breast or hips imagery, clitoral cherries or vaginal and labial flowers, for example. The only vaginal opening here would be referred to would be the ugly wound of castration. So there, you know, there's a lot um, in this paper about it. So I'll skip over some of the things. For example, the phallus, uh, the mouth, they said, might represent the urethra and the ejaculation of fluid from the mouth like, the ejac uh, like ejaculation. Uh, so contrast this with, um, for example, um, let's see. A young woman patient, this is in the paper, reported a dream. She said, I was on board a small boat during a heavy storm. The boat pitched and I slid back and forth in it and I became seasick. I awoke vomiting. Now Lewin says, besides many associations following this dream, dealing with her ideas about pregnancy, and prenatal existence, this female patient associated the dream, he said, to it should be associated to a coitus, and that the motion of the boat, he said, suggested the motion of coitus, and that she herself was the penis sliding back and forth in the vagina. Now, the associations to pregnancy are definitely heard by him, but they're noted and they're, they're ignored and they're not permitted to advance to any associations to morning sickness as a female experience associated with the pregnant body. So he used this to show that the early pregnancy considerations of vomiting and so on were really phallic issues associated with the mouth, the urethra. So you can see there's an enormous amount of distortion in these ideas. Here are more examples of what I think of as the vanished pregnant body in reporting a female's association. Bodily sensations which might arise from an erect penis, he said. As she lay in bed, her body felt as if it were swelling and getting hot. It seemed to get longer, tension and anxiety increased. She felt an overwhelming urge to scream, screaming associated with loss of sphincter control and the analyst showed that this tension repeated phallic sensations which she'd had as a child when she was unwilling, an unwilling passive witness to adult coitus. So this body experience, in my opinion, is being pushed and narrowed by Lewin to his certain interpretation of her body phallus. It could, however, more easily be interpreted, interpreted as her fantasy of future pregnancy and birth with screaming which terrified her and apparently birth terrified her. And perhaps this fantasy associated too with parental intercourse. And my point is that what is not in someone's mind, I'd say would not in an analyst's mind, but what's not in anybody's mind, I think, can clearly, um, uh, clearly gets overlooked if you think it's impossible. So that's a kind of plug to think Many things are more possible than we think. So a quick thing about one of my own cases, for example, where I would uh, hear some uh, imagery like that and I use, um, and I'm fond of um, uh, Kathy, my friend who just came in, wrote uh, and brought her attention to Virginia Woolf who wrote, we look to our mothers if we are women and it's, uh, that is a very difficult notion for phallocentric culture to um, tolerate. 
but I find that a lot in my female patients, um, male uh, associations are very important too, but these female associations with mother are extremely important. So here are some things, for example, that a woman, um, like four years into psychoanalytic work, um, she have a dream about pregnancy, I mean, she wasn't pregnant at the time, but she was talking and thinking about it as, and as an imagined sense of a future, not with any sense of urgency about becoming pregnant, but just a, a sense of inhabiting her female body. In this dream, she said, there's an elephant, or is it a whale? I think I'm in its belly. I'm suffocating and struggling and struggling to escape, and suddenly it's like a cave. There's plenty of room, I think. There's plenty of food here. Then I turn into an, then I turn into an elephant, like the ones in parades you see in India. I'm ambling down the street with a beautiful silk gold paisley cover on my back and a gold and scarlet rope loosely hung around my belly. I feel content. Isn't that weird? And then the patient had ready associations to pregnancy, the stories of mother, to comparison where her own bodily experience was similar, where it was different. She had a bigger frame than her mother, for example. She carried her baby low, where her mother carried hers high, etc. She'd had a baby at some point before. To an activated fantasy of a strong desire for fusion and oneness with her mother to associations with me and her analysis and so on. And she said at some point, I just want to be like you, I want to be in your belly, I wish you'd be my mother. So you can see that they, there is a great um, uh, and a powerful issue about female bodies here that would be very distorted, I think, if I were to say this is uh, some kind of male-derived thing. Here's another moment in her 20th year being in a modeling agency at mother's behest. Mother was a kind of stage mother. Uh, she said, uh, it was perfect for me. I thought of myself as being entirely grown up. I was showing off gloriously. I was displaying everything I had. And I knew from mother it was good. That's the other side of these warnings. It dawns in you, she thinks you're powerful and that you're an incredibly, unbearably enticing creature. I longed to be pregnant. I used to push my little slim belly out a bit. Here, folks, this is what I have. Look at my lithe little belly. It'll grow big someday. Now, in the older days, this activity on her part would be solely seen as phallic aspiration. But I, I heard her as saying, can I compete with you? Can I show my sex? Can I display my body in an image or metaphor? Will you retaliate? All the kinds of things that might come up uh, in relation to a female or a senior female. Now, the last part of my talk is about how having a baby ultimately is actually best thought of separately from motherhood. That these there is nothing about having a baby or being having that potential that needs to be immediately associated with a compulsion to any kind of gender or whatever. The only thing that is necessary is a female body and not a male body. So these days we're getting to know far more complexly openly and freely lived sex and gender expressions and scenarios of people's lives. The modern turn shows even more urgently that understanding psychologically can be optimized more fully if we think of the body as a sexed male or female body and more in a binary fashion that is unfashionable and thus slightly different in the psychological register where there is huge complexity of gender. Um, and I say what masculine or feminine mean, for example, involves a huge individual array of possibilities. But what is just male or female is a bolder kind of and a more stable um, sort of um, entity. So in the 1960s, shockingly, not very long ago, and Roe v. Wade, if a woman were fertile, the only former ways to escape, this was when... Um, the pill was introduced, 
but formerly the only ways to escape yearly motherhood were very shaky birth control, like douches or spermicide creams and so on, and or using the rhythm method, um, or plain celibacy, or giving the child away, or murder. And as you know, many women died giving childbirth, giving they died giving birth up to the discovery of childbirth's fever response to Catholic cleanliness. And the toll on women's bodies was vast. The size of families was huge, with the grim reaper as the only limiting factor and the many harrowing childhood deaths from infection. So it's no wonder people carry with them intergenerational representations of a fear of pregnancy at some point and a fear that they'll have to lay down their lives in order to give birth. The road to motherhood has been filled with ecstatic joys of creating life and belonging and taking part in growth. Po the powerful heritages of motherhood, womankind, <coughs> and parenthood, but it's a road that also has been torturous, arduous, rageful for some, filled with helplessness and mourning. However, these days, medically and biologically speaking, a woman truly has a choice she can successfully tamper with mother nature, as it were, due to reliable contraception and the ever sophisticated assistant reproductive technology. So more and more the meaning of maternality for individuals is the issue, I think, in sex and gender when it comes to childbearing. Gay and lesbian social acknowledgement was beginning the civil rights law only in 1964 and onwards, and it was only recognized in psychiatry in the US in 1986 that this was not a sickness or a pathological condition. But obviously to get back to motherhood, gay, bisexual, or queer women are all quite capable of becoming pregnant and giving birth and being mothers. Anyone with a female body can do this if they want to. And I think that we need to acknowledge the experiences of the natal body we are born into, regardless of gender or transgender that people report or develop, as well as opening up to the ways that such a body may be imaginatively recreated by the varying emphases of the internalized sex and gendered objects of family life. Um, a woman can be clear in her body that she's a woman, simultaneously aware she has her father's gait or take up all kinds of sports that are characteristically male. It doesn't really matter. Or a boy can have a soft-bodied male as his father, a man who may be very comfortable in his own skin and feel manly, and that's what his son will find as more manly. Um, so a story in relation, a little bit about motherhood, and then I'll stop. So the liberation of the sexed body from the more sophisticated gender portrait makes for an enormous variety for people who have female bodies who have potential to give birth. And one can see that taking care of a little child is not a task that has to be confined to the person who has given birth to that child. So that motherhood is separated now also from the idea of giving birth. The most straightforward route to motherhood, of course, is the female person who has a desire to be like enough her own mother to give birth, should her mother have given birth to her. And it's called cisgendered, as you probably know. It's a contemporary term. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It means being comfortable as the gender that matches the sex assignment of your body. As you know, the fact of being female does not dictate a person's object choice of lover nor does it dictate the sexual behaviors and aims of that individual. Homosexuality is a topic of great interest to be just to be deconstructed, just as is homosexuality, bisexuality, transgendered sexuality, any kind of sexuality. So it, here, is, uh, here are a couple of stories, and then I'll stop. Um, here is something that was very interesting to us because these were people who are in our field and they gave a presentation at our local uh, society. 
A middle-aged, elegantly dressed woman, a child psychoanalyst, and her husband, a psychiatrist, sat on the podium with her 27-year-old grown-up child who was born female. They told how they each had coped with her transgendered condition that was obvious in early puberty, probably earlier in life. A description of Jane. Jane had cropped short hair. She had shining brown eyes and a ready smile. She wore khaki pants and a loose Oxford button-down white shirt, beautiful jewelry, a tie, and laced brown shoes. Visually, she could have been male. To the conventional eye, Jane was a visual pastiche of gender dissonance. Jane told us it was all right to call her she. She had reassumed her female name a number of years ago. For a year in her early 20s, she had bound her breasts and tried out male pronouns and a male name and lived a male existence and had discovered then that she felt no more at ease in living male than female and so elected eventually to hold on to the pleasures of her female body while dressing conventionally male. The parents and she told a story of worry and subtle and not so subtle objection to the acceptance on the parents' part and early subtle rebellion on Jane's part. There'd been hopes, fights, anxieties, moments of dark despair and intense rage. Jane was now happy, much happier, was a psychologist herself helping people with gender trouble and she was married to a young lesbian woman with long dark hair and a voluptuous female body who was cisgendered, which means she was comfortable in the body that she was born into. The keystone to their struggle toward mutual understanding was that all three gradually acknowledged that they did not precisely know who Jane was in regard to gender. I, uh, this was a very moving part of their story to them. It was important that all three of them said that they fully accept that she was, as opposed to specifying who she was, and that this was a building block towards a more secure identity for her and them as parents. The parents said they had no refuge in the comfort of any assumption about their own child, they couldn't assume that just because they were the way they were that her, their child would be like that. Jane said she had been thrown out of both men and women's public toilets, but that this pain was in exchange for a relative piece of authenticity. So these young, legally married American women will be likely parents someday. And you can hear from the description and what she had, they've gone through that the mature emotional qualities of tolerance, forgiveness, introspection, and ability to be flexible, if hard won, would more than qualify them likely as excellent parents. The young couple demonstrates, they demonstrate vividly that it would be the femaleness of the body that will determine the experience of pregnancy. So either one of them could be, they could become pregnant with the baby and therefore biological motherhood, but they may, the young woman who dresses herself as male and feels male may not want to call herself a mother. And then I have another story about a patient of mine, who's 59, who um, she told me early on about her young children and um, she uh, was embarrassed to say, I said, the child is four, the woman is 59. Uh, I said, she's adopted. And uh, she said, no. Um, I, it was a long, hard struggle to have her. She said, but she's the best thing I ever did. The baby was the result of an ovum that belonged to another woman and sperm that came from a sperm bank, all matched up according in a kind of tailored design to dark haired and the same ethnic origins as the couple, um, the same class, same level of education, and um, they had two children in this way, and even a boy chosen to have proclivity in mathematics like the father, like the 
couple that were marrying the father, who was going to be the father of the child. And the little girl was the apple of their eye, adorable, smart, everything they wanted. So one hears the same risks that any parent takes, children and parents as hostages of fortune. Part of a woman's backstory, this part of this woman's backstory involved her terror of her own very neurologically disturbed and psychologically damaged older brother. She'd been fearful of her own genes, so scared that she had delayed marriage and even a knowledge of a desire to have a child till she was well over 40. So, finishing up that psychological motherhood without giving birth, say by using a surrogate, is another dimension open to transgendered women, for example, and all will have fascinating internal stories. But the female body itself is necessary for housing a child for the foreseeable future, and perhaps cisgendered motherhood will become a term in car common parlance that is, having a person you regard as a caretaking mother who actually give birth to you. And maybe this experience has, that used to be everything for the life of a child, in spite of all the distortions it's subjected to and the demands of heter for heterosexuality that are so very common now, someday that might be considered a special condition of the sexed body. Who knows? So thank you for listening so patiently. So my question would be, um, you talked a lot obviously about the pregnant body, but what about the psychoanalytic implications for infertile women or women who were married to infertile men and then could not become pregnant? Oh, well, I think that's a tremendously important issue because um, what I would mean by um, the capacity to become pregnant. So the infertile woman will probably not have known that she was infertile until a certain point in her life when she's sort of confronted with an actual wanting to have a baby. So the psychology of that will also, the psychology of her infertility will also involve the fact that she has a female body, that she grew up perhaps with all kinds of ideas about the possibility of having a child and then taking into account her profound disappointment and so on and trying to work through the grief and the mourning that that condition uh, brings about. Or uh, some infertile women in the course of working in a in-depth complex therapy sometimes discover that they had mixed feelings. I don't mean to say that it was in any way their doing. I mean, that's, it is not their doing that they became infertile. These biological forces are bigger than all of us. You don't plan to do something like that. But it, you might find, or a person might find, that they had more representations for um, either being uh, not having a child at all or, for example, identifications with uh, family members who didn't have a child and always sort of wanted to be like that anyway. You know, there may be all manner of things that come out of it, but I think that the thing about the natal body is, you know, what was it like to inhabit that natal body before you either knew you were infertile or fertile? So. That's the way I'd think about it. It's a very good question. <laughs> okay. Well, I was kind of curious to hear a little bit more about um, the uh, concept of childbirth and how this is influenced by childbirth. I mean, there's a growing movement here in the US and much more so in Europe on the emphasis of natural birth and that birthing is a natural feminine process. And I'm wondering whether that's a, a kind of a, maybe a realization of the naturalness and of, of the female body or whether it's just kind of a, a development from this kind of a need to correlate motherhood with birthing, you know, because it's, right. very, it's very mixed and it can be very, um, 
in Europe especially, it can be, can very, be very militant. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it can. I think that, I, I don't really know Paloma. I mean, I think that it's a very interesting issue, but I, I think that it has um, shifted it, it, their trends, you know, that in the 19, let's see, the 1970s, there was a big trend about all about natural childbirth. And then uh, people got away from that in the 1980s, and it sort of goes back and forth. And I, I would suspect the current militancy may have to do with the reaction against the technological forces that are so prevalent in everything to do with childbearing these days, a kind of rebellion against that. You know, we will not be pushed around by machines and x-rays and so on. You know, we will try to take charge of this ourselves and a, a kind of naturalness in that way. So I, I think that they sort of, the, the fashions come and go and that might be at the moment one of the fashions. Um, it is interesting, um, that some of the research about, there's very little research about the actual experience of, uh, there's more from Sweden and Finland and places like that, um, midwives who do research on uh, women's feelings, like right after the giving birth, and some, uh, like some portion of women feeling very, um, as if they weren't true women, unless they experienced every single pain <laughs> and every single dimension without any kind of external help at all. And, you know, I think that that is probably taking it a bit far. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like saying, well, you're a better person, your character is better if you don't take aspirin for a headache. You know, it's much better to suffer the headache than to take the aspirin. Um, I, I don't think it makes, I don't think it makes people either more or less, you know, because these are the issues of femininity. It's not really about, fe the femaleness is there, you know, the baby is there, the body is there, but the expressions of being female are uh, all loaded, very loaded. I'm going out on a limb here, and I'm not sure who I'm quoting exactly, but I but I recently read a theory that um, because women have such an obvious biological capacity for creativity, um, they don't need to be creative with the same kind of vengeance as men sometimes do, and that the suggestion was that men are driven to creative processes because they're trying to make up for the fact that they can't make life. <laughs> I sort of like that. I, have I like, well, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I think we, we do like that idea, but, I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that I would um, I, I actually necessarily um, go for that in terms of the direct comparison. On an individual basis, I think that's all I can speak on, that on an individual basis, it is very often the case, one notices that a woman who's pregnant or she's busy in early caretaking, she doesn't have time to paint or she doesn't have the time to uh, reflect on things in such a way that she perhaps did before as a painter and may take a little time out, but then it usually just comes back again in full force, you know. I mean, so men go through cycles of creativity and lack of creativity also. Uh, and, but men will speak of, in an analysis, um, they do often associate to the envy of a baby and how to, you know, all the, the envy that goes into um, one sex is inevitably envious of the other because we were all children and little children want to be everything. If you have anything to do with little children, they want to be, girls want to be a girl and a boy and a boy wants to be a boy and a girl. <laughs> so we want everything. 
And I think we are very prone to envy the other's obvious capacities that we don't have. So I think it's a very nice theory, but I, I don't know if it goes across the board, and maybe it does. <laughs> Um, I, I keep thinking about your comment um, in regards to sort of just because you have a child doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be maternal or raise it in that regard. And I, I think of um, the sort of old quote, you know, it, it takes a village to raise a child. And I think of more so indigenous peoples and the, their approach to um, and if you have any comment on that, if you study that at all, and the mentality, if you see a great difference in the mentality towards bearing a child and being pregnant and also female and male energy, it's a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that, that's, um, I wish I did know more about that. I mean, I, 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 I have not um, specifically studied. In the older days in analysis, people did do a lot of uh, looking at Papua New Guinea and so on, and uh, came up with all kinds of ideas about how they were freer than we were and closer to the soil and so on. And subsequently, I think anthropologists have felt that that was rather arrogant, on a kind of arrogant Western idea that in some way they were, you know, it was a kind of reverse psychology. They're better in some way than we are. But the idea of the associative idea of the, it takes a village to raise a child. One of the things, uh, you know, and in that sense that these uh, extended generations of people around in older cultures and old Europe too, you know, that one of the virtues of that actually may be that various uh, qualities that might be there if you were, had an isolated mother and baby and mother and father and baby and just the triad all on their own, that certain quali personality qualities may be much more intense and difficult to deal with for the child. Whereas if, they, if there's a, more of an extended family, the child has more adults to call on and they, so do the parents, you know. So one often hears that. In fact, at the Yale Student Health Services sometimes we hear young people talk about, you know, really what terrible parenting they'd had, and yet the therapist will report that the person that they're seeing seems to be, you know, a, quite a mensch, and, you know, its capability of making friendships, and, you know, they say, well, how can this be? You know, the parental history was so terrible for this person, and we, one of the old therapists used to say, look to the grandparents, you know, look to the aunts and uncles. There has, somebody has helped that child to have an identification with the capacity to make friends or to trust people enough or something. So I, I think there's much to be said for <laughs> more than just the individual intense one-to-one -one kinds of relationships that very isolated families can get involved in. I wanted to um, take my privilege uh, to ask the last question, which is I've been thinking about lactation, breastfeeding, mm -hmm. um, because it seems to me, because of the things like the La Leche League in New York, um, that this emphasis in the last couple of decades on the absolute necessity mm -hmm. of breastfeeding the child for an extended period of time, at least six months or so, is might be some way to actually connect the body capable of being pregnant to the body that's responsible for being the mother to the child. So it's interesting also that with lactation, there's a whole kind of visual problem of whether it's allowed to be visible in public or and so on. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about the visibility of the recently having given birth body. Right. Well, I, I, I think that that's, I would say, you know, for the way I think that that's really right on, that they, there is this kind of lingering horror, you know, that the idea of kind of looking for many people uh, who aren't thinking about it necessarily consciously. I mean, that's the tricks of our unconscious. I mean, we, we have this, these other 
kind of more subterranean, darker thoughts a lot. And you know, the sight of somebody in a subway or something breastfeeding for some group of individuals may become a kind of horror show because it's a reminder, you know, that this infant came out, you know, in this bloody way and was given birth through the, the vagina. And, you know, it's a short uh, jump to that's how I came into the world. And the horror of, you know, that this was a, a, such a kind of animal process and so on for some people that um, uh, it may be too vivid for them, as it were. But I don't think it's, I think we should educate the public <laughs> rather than <laughs> just say, well, it's just too vivid and then we, we can't stand looking at it. I mean, you know, you know all that about that. And exhibitions, you know, you, 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 certain things when you confront the populace and get them used to ideas, they, they take in more also than, um, they, they do better with it than one hopes for their worst, most angry <laughs> sort of parts of themselves. So. Well, Rosemary Balsam, thank you so much for a wonderful discussion. <laughs>